Welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I am your host, Lauren Green. Join me this season as we discuss the political news of the day, the issues that matter to you, and the impact all of it has on our future. I'm glad you're here. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Green. Um, I hope wherever it is where you are, that things are cooling down um, after a very hot summer. Uh, But here, actually, uh, the weather is cooling down, but elections are heating up. There is so much happening all the time from so many different angles. And it's October, right, which means we can never uh, not be ready for the October surprise. But also early voting is starting here in a couple of weeks. Uh, absentee voting has already started across the country. And so we are very much in GOTV season. Um, I hope everyone is getting out the vote in their respective capacities, whether you're mailing in your ballot or knocking on doors or whatever uh, voting might be for you. I'm I'm excited to see what this historic election will unfold. Um, But something really interesting actually happened recently that I am frankly confused about and I hope is not a indicative of what's to come at all or or any type of canary in the coal mine. And that is the comments that came this week from President Barack Obama about uh, Black men not supporting Kamala Harris. Uh, If you haven't heard them, here's a small clip. Based on reports I'm getting from campaigns and communities is that um, we have not yet seen the same kinds of energy and turnout in all quarters of our neighborhoods and communities as we saw when I was running. Now, I also want to say that that seems to be more pronounced with the brothers. So if you don't mind, just for a second, I'm going to speak to y'all directly. And say that when you have a choice that is this clear, when on the one hand you have somebody who grew up like you, knows you, went to college with you, understands the struggles and pain and joy that comes from those experiences. Who's had to work harder and do more and overcome and achieves the second highest office in the land and is putting forward concrete proposals to directly address the things that are vital in our neighborhoods and our communities, from housing to making sure that our our, our mothers and our our fathers and our grandparents can afford medicine, and and making sure that we are dealing with prices that are too high and rents that are too high and, and are committed to is committed to making sure that we maintain the Affordable Care Act so everybody's got help here and cares about things like education and entrepreneurship in our neighborhoods. And that's on one side. And on the other side, you have someone who has consistently shown disregard, not just for the communities, but for you as a person. And you're thinking, about sit now. <laughs> now, for those of us who have been around uh, a while, the the notion of President Obama uh, being condescending or talking down to Black communities is is unfortunately not new. Uh, I I for the record, I don't hear it the same way a lot of other people do. But uh, this every time Obama speaks to Black people, it seems like there's this general response. Um, that he's being condescending or talking down to them. I think it is primarily driven by the media. 
I don't, I never encountered anyone in real time who has this perspective and suddenly within 48 hours, it's everywhere. Um, but it is nonetheless common. It was made uh, in his response at, or in his remarks at Morehouse's commencement in 2013. Prior to that, the Congressional Black Caucus allegedly felt that he was speaking down to them in some private meetings. I think that to me, there's a difference between uh, speaking directly, speaking plainly and like calling someone out um, or being disrespectful or being condescending. I, I was raised in a time and space where uh, we address things head on. And so um, to the extent that, that that is what he's doing, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I do think it's interesting with this last go round in particular, uh, President Obama was speaking at a campaign office to a group of black men, I believe in Pittsburgh or somewhere in Pennsylvania. Now, we all know that swing states are the name of the game during election season, not that the rest of your votes uh, don't count, but that, that is where people spend the bulk of their time, money, and attention. And so the idea of deploying a former president to Pennsylvania in October is completely reasonable. Um, the idea of having President Obama address black men to me is completely reasonable. What is unreasonable is the reactions that are coming honestly from everywhere, left, right, middle, uh, that are actually conflicting and don't make sense to me, which is why I think this is this is confusing. So within about 48 hours of President Obama making what I thought were very plain comments, right? Like, hey, you might want to pay attention. Hey, this guy wasn't that good for us. Um there were all of these black men on Twitter, you know, putting up videos about how ridiculous it was and how they're not going to be told who to vote for. They're not going to have their black manhood, you know, uh, measured in this moment by this vote. All of that is reasonable. I didn't hear President Obama measure anyone's black manhood like that. That wasn't what he said. Um, and also in that case, then why doesn't it bother you when these old rappers want to tell you who to vote for, when random athletes want to tell you who to vote for. Like, this is just kind of what happens in a democracy. I don't know why this in particular, well, that's not true. I do know why. But this particular comment upset folks. Um, spoiler alert, I, I think it's because they know he's effective. They know President Obama taps into particular communities, and so they would rather muddy the waters. And by they, I mean uh, the right or Republicans or Fox News would rather muddy the waters with something being uh, condescending or disrespectful because they understand that in the, to the extent that the message takes hold, President Obama is a very effective communicator. And so in an effort to keep his message from doing that, they want to... Uh, pretend as though he was out of line or out of pocket. Uh, and that's that's ridiculous. On the other side of the aisle, you have people like Roland Martin who think that Black men are not getting a fair shake, who think that it is uh, more reasonable to, to be talking to white men and white women than it is Black men because historically Black men have voted uh, at a level only surpassed by Black women for Democrats. And so why are you, I, I guess, if from Roland Martin's perspective, President Obama is perpetuating this narrative that uh, the Black men are not supporting Vice President Harris when that's not true. Uh, I think this is a little bit of chicken and egg. I think for those of us who are unfortunate enough to live online, the frankly, the content is there. There is a lot of energy put into Black men not supporting VP Harris, whether the data shakes out or not, I don't know, but I will tell you in my conversations with people and in what I've seen online, that hasn't been the case. Uh, there is a lot of skepticism um, on for a, some of it based on misinformation, some of it based on uh, choices that she's made in office, some because they don't see themselves in her, whatever it might be. Uh, but I do think that there is room to speak to this plainly and directly. And to the extent that you do it to a Black audience, I don't see the problem. The question I have for Roland Martin and people like, and people like him is, President Obama is not the first to say this, this election cycle. We've got clips of everyone from Magic Johnson to... Um, 
CBC chair Stephen Horsford to uh, Lieutenant Governor Galvin, Gavin Gilchrist in Michigan, all speaking directly to Black men about supporting Vice President Harris. And so I'm curious why that didn't upset you in the same way, why you didn't feel a need to go on a press tour and media tour about those comments, and why those also were not perceived as being condescending and disrespectful. Um, for instance, Magic Johnson said this. Now, there's a lot of Black men in here, and I don't mean to, you know, not talk to other people, but this is important. Our black men, we got to get them out to vote. That's number one. Kamala's opponent promised a lot of things last time to the black community that he did not deliver on. And we got to make sure we help black men understand that. So that's why I'm here to make sure I understand, help black men understand. First, get out and vote, and then vote for the next president of the United States, Kamala Harris. I would assert that the notion or concern that black men don't understand who they're voting for or don't understand the impact that a lot of Trump's policies had could be equally condescending, uh, disrespectful. And again, no one is lighting things on fire, burning stuff down. I think ultimately what happens here is President Obama is a very effective messenger. And people are concerned that if that message sticks, it will have an impact on this election. After President Obama made his statements where he regardless of how you interpret it, spoke directly to the issue of Black men potentially sending out this election or uh, concerns around misogyny. Vice President Harris's campaign rolled out an agenda for Black men, an opportunity agenda for Black men. Uh, it's clearly targeted to young Black men. I think a lot of people will be able to benefit from it. Um, but ultimately, the primary takeaways are a significant amount in small business loans in an effort to get or in an effort to help black men start businesses, along with the much needed legalization around marijuana, cannabis and promises of programs to make sure that black people take advantage of those. Well, to make sure that black people are the ones who benefit from that legalization, which I think is really important. We've seen the way the cannabis has grown recently and to have prisons full of black men for that and then have a bunch of older or wealthier white people benefiting from it has frankly been a bad look. So I definitely appreciate the attention and intention there. I think this is a, a great step. I do think that I hope Black men engage with this and feel listened to. I hope that it is received as genuinely as it was sent. And I hope that to the extent that there are disagreements, that people are willing to engage with those in earnest, that this does not become a troll fest or a frustration. The data that I've read says that President Trump received 12% of the vote from Black men. Um, and while that's not high, especially in the grand scheme of, of an entire election, I think it's worth noting that this election will probably be closer than that. <laughs> will probably um, come down to, to every vote counting, really and truly. And even then, we don't know what's going to happen uh, when they certify election results, when electors put in their votes. I mean, there, there's a lot on the line. And so every vote counts. And I'm going to say what I say all the time, which is that to the extent people are coming to you and asking for your vote, that is proof that your vote matters. That is proof that of all of the places they could have gone, they decided that this was the space they wanted to operate in. And that can't be taken lightly. So we've seen Vice President Harris across her share of swing states. We've seen them deploying surrogates across several others. And I imagine that will at a minimum stay the same, if not increase between now and election day. 
But all of that is because of the importance and magnitude of what is being asked for here. This is not in an attempt to disrespect people. This is not an attempt to be condescending. This is not to say that you don't know what's best for your community. It's to say that this election is too important to sit out um, and too important to uh, protest or or pretend like, like, like both sides are equal. Like that's just categorically untrue. And so as, as we look to these next, honestly, four-ish weeks, um, things are winding down, barely, actually not even a month left. There will be some tough decisions made. You'll see a host of people show up. You'll see a host of people um, put their names in the hat. And one more note I want to make on this is the idea of pandering or engaging with politics uh, in, in a way that feels I guess dishonest is the closest I can think to it. Ultimately, I think the difference between pandering and speaking to a constituent's base need during an election season comes down to trust. It comes down to believing that someone means what they say and will show up for you. I'm the first to admit that Black people have every right to be skeptical of our governmental decisions, processes, things that have been done. Like history does not always bode well in our favor. And people have said things and done other things when they get in office. I will fully and wholly own that. And anyone who is critical or skeptical from a historical lens makes a lot of sense. I get that. I get that. I get that. At the same time, as someone who pays attention to politics when a lot of other people don't, it is a lot of effort <laughs> to get people to pay attention to a candidate, to get people to pay attention to an election. And sometimes entertainers are helpful in that. It doesn't always mean that they're pandering. And one of the reasons that uh, they could just be utilizing that person's platform in an effort to take advantage of the people who pay attention to that person. Classic example being um, that Meg the Stallion performed at a rally um, on AUC or Atlanta University Center's campus. This was uh, earlier in the in the election, maybe, you know, maybe even before the convention, I can't quite recall. But there were so uh, many notions of that being pandering and disrespectful and like, oh, how can how can she do that? Hotties for Harris. This is this is not what we need. We need policy, blah, blah, blah. OK, um, I hear that. I get that. And when Taylor Swift endorsed Kamala Harris, I didn't hear a bunch of cries about pandering. I didn't hear a bunch of, oh, this isn't genuine. The assumption was that that was a genuine and active moment because there has been more trust built there than there has been here. And so I want us to take a second and acknowledge that pandering is real, but it isn't always the case. And ultimately, if what you're looking for is policy, the policies are up, they have been up, the issues are up, the events are happening across the country. If you wanna show up and ask questions, there is so much coverage about this, that however you need to engage, there are opportunities to do so. So don't feel like solely because you aren't seeing it maybe on your Twitter or X feed or on your Instagram feed that it's not there. It definitely is. I would suggest that you take a look at it and engage for yourself whether or not that works for you. That was this episode of Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. If you're looking for me, you can find me at Miss Lauren D. Green. And if you're looking for the show, you can find us at Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered.com. Thanks for being here. That was this episode of Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. If you want to hear more of the show, visit Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered.com. If you want to reach me, find me on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Lauren D. Green. That's M S Lauren D. Green. Hope to hear from you soon.